any further delay, I want to, um, it's my profound honor to introduce Chief Dave Erskine. Thank you, Liz, and uh, I want to thank also the Community Center for uh, allowing us to have this call tonight. It's very, very convenient, and uh, it brings back memories of some of the great times we had. Also, uh, I'd like to thank all the people that came here tonight and attended this program. I, was very, I always thought that I was very fortunate to grow up in the town of Stonington, and then later, work in the town of Stein. I always said, and when I go to the high school, uh, to the local history class, I always say that Stonington is one of the best communities around, and I'll argue with anybody on that. They, it's a great community, great place to grow up, and there's no better place. I, but growing up in Stonington area, I got two to three mile radius from the old Como was something you're never going to forget. There was a lot of things going on in that time between 1945 and 1970. There were the velvet mill was open, and they were working three shifts there. They were working three shifts at Monsanto. The Kellum's company was down here. There was, three, there was at least 350 to 400 students in the borough school. Now there's none. Uh, there were 30 to 40 fishing boats. There was a nine-hole golf course. There were five gas stations within a quarter of a mile of this building. And there was just so much going on. And uh, there were only four sports at that time at Stonington High School. Now there's 19. So we took care of it. The community center took care of everybody's needs. And uh, Title 19 and Title 9 was not in effect until 1972. But when, you're going to, when, when I go on with some of the programs here tonight, you're going to find that uh, Frank Turk took care of everybody. He made sure there was anybody needed anything, he took care of them. Without that, I'll stop. In 1945, July 10th, 1945, John Finley was elected president of the Stoughton Community Center, incorporated at its first meeting at, of the organization held last night in the building of the Stonington Ambulance Corps. Other officers elected was Vice President Albert Gildersleeve, Treasurer Alice Powers, and Secretary Elizabeth Trumbull. To more than 40 people who attended the meeting, Mr. Finley pointed out that the purpose of this center is to provide recreation for youths and adults. Funds have to be raised, work has to be done on the building leased from the Stonington Ambulance Corps. Uh, we, uh, we, the community center, uh, leased the building from the Stoynton Ambulance Corps. Uh, Clarence Bittner of Westley YMCA spoke at the meeting about the activities and also stressed the need of volunteers. Also, of a director who will be, bring enthusiasm and make the project work. All right, meeting two. Members of the various committees of Stoynton Community Center were announced, finance, budget, membership, house committee, and eight uh, members, eight center members to each committee. Named to committee to hire a director was Al Gildersleeve, Reverend John Frey, Clarence Wimfimer, Mr. Mrs. James Young, Reverend Mark Paulson, and John Finley. The third meeting was in August of 9th of 1945. James Martin was named general chairman of the first fund drive, assisted by Mrs. Angus Cheesebro, Jr., in charge of the women's division, and Walter Redden, head of the men's division. They will, be a, they will be a complete, they will compete against each other, and the goal is $7,000. Well, I don't know who won the, I never got the results of who won the men or the women, but by September 19th, they had $8,200 collected, so they're on their way. A little history of the building across the street. In July of 1894, the Aryan Singing Society, music singing group, organized by the, in Stornington, mostly a German employees of the Velvet Mill. Gustin Mueller was the president. July 10th, 
1909, the plans and specification of a new clubhouse and dance hall for the Aryan Singing Society of Stonington are in the hands of the building committee. Work starts. And in November of 1909, the Aryan Singing Society opened its building with a ball and appropriate exercises. In October of 1923, improvements made to the Aryan Clubhouse will be given to increase floor space so they can play basketball and the stage was removed. In 1924, the Stonington Ambulance Corps was organized and had its first election. Dr. William Vale was elected president. And in the same month, a new ambulance gift of Clarence Winfine, and he bought them a new ambulance. Owner of the American Velvet has arrived. The ambulance is in the quarters prepared for its rear of the Aryan Club. The, the ambulance court always had the back of the building. In November of 1930, the new American Velvet Employees Club and Stonington was composed and employees of the Velvet Mill were open in the evening at the Aryan, house, at the Aryan Clubhouse. In September, at this, uh, September of 1938, a disastrous hurricane tidal wave hit Stonington and the surrounding towns. Uh, the American Velvet Employees Club, usually center of the winter activity of Stonington, had been inactive season because of the floodwaters, covered the bowling alleys, left the basement completely a mess. Heavy layoffs at the Velvet Mill, and a few weeks ago, went towards cutting employees' programs. Also, the Stonington Ambulance lost their ambulance in that hurricane. Uh, in 1940, the Stonington Ambulance Corps buys the American Velvet Employees Club, known as the Aryan Club. The purchase was made from Clarence Quinfiner. And then the Stonington Community Center in 1948 paid $6,000 to buy the Stonington Community Club, uh, uh, Stonington Ambulance Corps. All right, for the director, in August, at the, uh, the director, is what they had. It, I got this quote from a couple of the members that were on the committee, and I liked them. The director has to be a trained physical social service worker. Much of success or failure at the center will lie in a man who can attract to Stonington. Everybody, every, everything which goes under sponsorship of the community center will be under the direct supervision. While a child is in the center, he will be in the hands of the director. The better the director, the better the child. John Finley. Also stress, stressing the importance of Clarence, was Clarence Winfimer. Said that the recreation time more and more shaping the habits of children. He declared the question of marks facing the adults of today must be resolved by adults of tomorrow, who are children around us every day. Community Center President John Finley uh, contacted Mr. Bittner, director of the Wesley YMCA, to see if he had someone who felt was interested in being a community center director and had, a job and had the job requirements. The director had three applications for the position. Mr. Bittner, small world, recommends a, name, a man named Frank Turek, who is presently in the U.S. Army Air Force up in Iceland. To locate Frank, he's interested in the position, and in April of 1946, starts at a salary of $3,000. Background on Frank Turek, a native of New York City, born August 14, 1914, son of Frank and Helen Turek. He lived and grew up in, in New York's Lower East Side, and his early education was in the New York school system. He was a member of the Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, and at this time, he got to know Mr. Bittner, who was in charge of the church youth group, which Frank was very involved with. Frank began his higher education at Springfield College, graduating in 1942, and graduated, enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Force while stationed in Spartansburg, South Carolina, he met Virginia McQueen. They were married November 12, 1942, and was a World War II veteran and retired as a U.S. Army Air Force Reserve Lieutenant Colonel. Mr. and Mrs. Turk had one son, Roger, who passed away in 2018. Frank arrived at Stony Community Sector 
but Frank served as Stonington Community Center Director for 38 years. He put a great deal of time into this job at the Como and was a one-man band custodian, coach, umpire, secretary, and a man with calm and uncomplaining endurances. Caring and child and family, he organized something to meet everybody's interest. Frank always found a way for every child to become a member if he could, if he, if he wanted to join. Frank's background, he helped many people get into college, helped others getting jobs, his activity in the community. Two years of the Board of Selectmen, 12 years on the Board of Education, 20 years on the Recreation Commission, Stoynton High School Athletic Boosters Club, Stoynton Little League, Stoynton Ambulance Corps, second member, he was Stoynton Ambulance Corps, second member to be certified as an EMT, two years president of Park and Alliance Club, Stoynton Tricentennial Scholarship Committee, Stoynton Fire Department, members of the United Church in Stoynton. Frank was in his fifth term as Connecticut State Representative when he passed away on May 3rd, 1991. Stoynton High School class of 1968 dedicated the yearbook to him, and the SHS class of 1984 named him Citizen of the Year. Terry McKenna said it best when he was defeated by the election against Frank. What did you expect? I was running against Santa Claus. <laughs> And November 17, 1969, Frank laid the cornerstone to the new, this building he has, New Stoynton Community Center, and said just as the schools were with their eyes, I hope the community center will continue to have their three L's, loyalty, leadership, and love. Okay, memberships. All right, April 1946, the cost of membership at Stoynton Community Center for ages 9 to 16 was $2.50 a year, and you could pay with 25 cents a month. <laughs> for over, over 16, a membership was $5 a year and could be paid in increments of 50 cents a month. In April of 46, the center to the date has 77 full paid members and partially paid members. And July, in January of 46, Frank reported 174 uh, members of the Senate, including 35 adults. In December of 4th of 1946, the Senate now has a total of six, 264 members, 11, 111 boys, 68 girls, and 85 adults. The bowling alleys are used by 46 members of the Men's League and 36 members of the Girls' League and 23 members of the Junior League. In 1947, there were 310 members presently of the Community Center. In 1950, a total of 269 uh, boys, girls, and adolescent members of the Community Center. In 1958, one disturbing note was known in the annual report that Director Turk, it was shown that membership had dropped from 380 in 1957 to 348 in 1958. 1959, membership went up to 455 compared to 348 a year ago. And in 61, that was when everything started to pop in the 60s on all the activities and everything. For the first time in the history of the membership, they went over the 500 mark. And figures show that membership total 72 grammar school, school boys, 72 grammar school girls. 125 junior high boys, 82 junior high girls, 50 high school boys, 23 high school girls, 81 adults, 18 members of a dancing activity, 12 in a golf lessons, and 16 in the Spanish class. So the membership stayed at the same price until 69. With all that years, they still had it. And then they, the Pine Point School, uh, you know, moved in over across the street from the ball field when they first started Pine Point School in 1946. They enrolled 20 members so that they could have activities here. And some of the members are right down there. You were in the group. I can remember because I live right next door to the school. And then uh, the center lost 30 members to the armed forces. And uh, 
they all made it back though. There was that I read the names and the program I had done years ago on the medal. They at least they all came back. World War II, a lot of them never seen the Como. Okay, it's uh, how the Como get its name. All right, Butch McDonough gave me the one that's on the left, and the one on the right is one that I got out of a newspaper that was published by the Stein Community Center News back in 1975. I would have to, I told Butch, God bless him, he's dead now, he died, but uh, I said, I'll put it up there, Butch, and uh, he, he swore that he had the right answer for it, but Frank kind of blessed this one here with uh, Pushy Lebrou, so, uh, I have to go with that one. <laughs> okay, Owens Field. Owens Field, uh, the history of Owens Field, uh, first it was owned by the Stanton family, Nancy Stanton property, North of Stonington Borough, has been sold to Fred Owens of Washington. The property is part of the uh, Stanton Park where athletic events took place. Stonington High School played their football and baseball there from 1910 to 1934 when the borough school was, the high school was at the top, third floor of the borough school. They kind of, when they built that, I, when you say that, it's, well, that was a total of 55 acres. There were 55 acres altogether because when the power, the power company bought the, the power stuff across the street here, they land there, they bought that from Fred Owen. So they owned a big piece of property, Owens Drive, all that property, uh, Stanton Road over there. And then what happened in 1940, the viaduct came in and the viaduct was completed and Trumbull Avenue was extended, separating Owens Field into two small fields, well, one was bigger than the other, but they, uh, So they, anyways, they, 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 they separated it. So they, the first thing, this is a picture of a diamond when they, when they had the Twilight League there. And the Twilight League was there from, they played, oh, for four or five years, there was a baseball team, the community center had a baseball team, they had two of them in the Twilight League, a matter of fact. And they, then they gave that up and, uh, Boy, Frank had leagues for uh, the grammar school and high school leagues. And then in 1951, Mystic, Mystic Little League started. And in 1952, the Brave Rules League started, the Mystic Junior High. Uh, not Mystic Junior High, but Mystic Junior League. And uh, then they started playing over there. And so then, like I said, the 1960s came and it was very, very busy. And probably the biggest headache I, I can see whether it would have had a major headache that they were having, they had so many children and they didn't have so strong, Mystic gave up some of their territorial area to the town of Stony, not to the Stony, to Stony Community Center, so Stonington could have a Little League. And so they established the Little League team because Frank was having, they were having uh, farm teams and they were having a pony league and so forth. So they established the Little League. All right, so, they start the Little League, and uh, yeah, I'm Brit Shusha. They, uh, <laughs> but anyways, up by the diamond, they built dugouts for the Little League. They were made out of cement blocks, and they had a, they put a fence around it, snow fence that we were using. Well, then I guess headquarters of the National Little League found out and told them that they had to have a stationary fence. So they weren't going to use a stationary fence to use, you know, have a fence down in here and everything so they can't play soccer or they can't play peewee football or anything. So they decide we're going to have to build across the street. So they went in across the street and they put a nice field in there and when they did, they fill, had to fill it in because it was very wet. And if you talk to any of the little league that played there, I see Jay out there, probably a little wet there, wasn't it, Jay, in the dugout sometime, a couple inches of water? And uh, so they filled it in, but they had concerns because they had 
They didn't want to see the fences up with advertisement. So the Village Improvement Society gave them $3,000 to put up a nice iron, green iron fence around the field. And so they did that, so they didn't put that in, and they built beautiful, beautiful brick dugouts. They were beautiful. And they had the dugouts there for about eight or 10 years, and then play stopped, and they really went to about 73, 74, and then uh, they gave that up. And they, the kids, the children that played in Little League from uh, town of Stony, in Stonington went to play in Parkertown. So that was it. They, and then softball started, and they had a fast pitch softball league, and uh, the Stoughton, it was a Stoughton Industrial Softball League, and uh, the Community Center Fast Pitch League, it was established in uh, 1955, and it lasted for about four years. And uh, the eight teams that were in it were Plaques, American Velvet, Kellums, Community Center, Fishermen, the High Gang, the Steamers, the Neptunes of the companies of the Borough Fire Department, and they had that for a while, and the, the girls had a softball league, and then the girls had a league that they played at the borough school. And this is a picture of one of the teams, and you can see they had, they had telephone poles up in the back here, and they also had some bleachers. And uh, they uh, took them down, and they, I can remember one time they had, a, they had a backstop with a ping pong table. <laughs> they had, you know, everything, change everything all of a sudden, you know, they made, but they got everybody's needs done, and that was what they counted, you know. So, uh, and we go to football, and this is the first Pee Wee football team. You'll see a lot of people in there. Uh, I can see my brothers up in the right hand corner, Eddie Haslin, Butch Watermaker, I think. Uh, Keith's up there. Dave, lean into uh, your mic a little. Alan Texera, Randy Wentz, Mike Edgar, Tommy Rogers, Dave Sadell. There's a Bazettes, two or three Bazettes in there. And uh, they established George Savin and Frank got Pee Wee football started in Stoughton. And then they had a league football, basketball, baseball, and all and so forth. Uh, this was a team, the Portuguese club. Benny Souza. When I did some research, there was never any soccer from 1935 to 1960. And then Benny Souza started the soccer up again. And they had some great soccer. These, that was the men's team. But he also started a clinic, and he started it with the younger players at the community center. And uh, it really snowballed. And uh, then Eddie Harrison and uh, Dick Woodworth got involved in it. And then Benny and uh, Frank went to the Board of Education, I believe, in 1971 and pushed to get the high school at soccer, and they did. Okay, this is an interesting one. One, one thing I, I forgot, almost forgot, <laughs> it's important. Start, that field, well, they, right now, they exists, which probably is the oldest that I know of. They started playing there in, in 1909, and it almost ended in 1967. The building committee was in the process of setting up to build a new uh, uh, community center, and they didn't have an area. They couldn't use the area where the old community center was. It wasn't big enough. They couldn't use the area across the street. We talked about the Little League being all wet. There were roads all around it. And uh, they didn't want that. So they were going to build it in Owens Field. And they went so far, and the architect got all the plans ready, and they were all set to build it. And uh, they were all set to build it, and they came through. Two ladies came through. Lisa Owen came through and donated two acres of right here, and Mrs. Finley, wife of former John Finley, the president, donated 6.8 acres, and they are joined to one another. So they had second thoughts about building it in Owens Field. And so they got test warrants here and so forth, 
and it worked out that the test foreman said that they wouldn't have a problem and uh, so they changed the plans and the land we sit on now those two ladies donated the property and we were fortunate or the community center would have been in Owens Field and but it took 17,000 yards of fill the fill the place in. <laughs> okay I almost forgot that all right tennis Okay, the board was thinking about uh, where they were going to wanted to put tennis because up until 1957, the only tennis courts in the town of Staunton was Wanawana Club and Mason's Island Yacht Club. Uh, that were the only two tennis courts. So they were looking to build tennis courts, and uh, but they didn't have any property either. So. January 30th, 1957, Mrs. Mabel Hyde of 74, age 74, 51 Main Street, Stonington, widow of George A. Hyde, died last night at Dave Kimball Hospital in New London following a long illness, and she survived by a niece of Beaches Raybon of New London. Now, in April of 57, the center is given the land adjoining the community center of Cutler Street by Beaches Raybon, in memory of Mabel Hyde. According to the deed, she was the executor of the property. She donated that property in memory of Mrs. Hyde. So the community center lucked out again with a donation. They set up a committee of uh, Joe Vargas, Steve Castle, and Henry Scheibner in October of 57. And by June of, June of 1958, they dedicated the tennis courts. That's how quick they went in. They got $8,000 and they put an exhibition on and they got it. And, uh, okay. Over here, back in the 50s, you know, I'm not even going to think I'm old, but <laughs> back in the 50s when it was cold, we. Uh, there was a lot of ice skating out here, and especially during the, the month of December and January, and school was out in session. And it says in December 28th of 55, a large group of youngsters have been skating for this week on the pond at the community center. All right, in April of 56, an ice skating pond project, which will provide a large, safe, and ice skating area for Stonington children, is under, will get underway this fall. Cooperating with the community project will be Elise Owen, which has given use of the land, the Village Improvement Association, which has authorized the expenditure of 300 for work, the Stonington uh, contractor, Chet Perkins, uh, that's from Perkins Farm, has offered to use the equipment and clean the swamp area for the ring. And Al Palmer Palmer's garage, which is the garage right over, right across from here, will last to provide services for the pond. Uh, the first step to provide a free skating surface for youngsters at the Stonington section has been taken by the Stonington Village Improvement Society. The pond has been sprayed with weed killer to clear the area and dangerous weeds and cattails. Uh, January 27, 1958, uh, it looked like there would be any further skating this winter because of the recent rains that brought down large amounts of marsh grass and froze on the pond. But the SSO Como, captained by Billy Texera, and first mate Don Hevington broke through the ice and cleaned the pond up for skating. And a combination of cold weather and school vacations brought crowds of youngsters to the skating pond. And then uh, in the 58, uh, Stonington has its first floodlighting skating area, a result of a project started by a local businessman. Albert Palmer, with the permission of property owner, Ms. Police Owen, lights have been installed and supports on Palmer's by Palmer, Joe Kessler, and Kirk Brown, and electrician Fred Buck. The lights are turned on each night with a surface safe for skating and remains on until 10 o'clock. And skating, was going for, it all depends on the weather. So, that's the... 
Okay, this was the first basketball team. This is a picture of a basketball team. Uh, I don't think anybody's alive. Uh, in the front there, uh, Rose, is that your brother in the front? Is he still alive? Yes, he is. Okay, I had a feeling there was one lot still alive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the fruit that Dickie Buck and Bobby uh, Sylvia and Bandy Reed and uh, Gilbert Victoria, some of the ones that I knew. But uh, that was Frank's first basketball team. Eddie Victoria is up on the right, Frank's on the left. And uh, basketball, you know, they would, he had all kinds of stuff. Frank had all kinds of activity for basketball. And one of the biggest ones, he started the junior high basketball league and it was a big area, uh, big program and then when the Recreation Department took over and uh, Stonington Recreation Commission came in and, and started in 1964. Some of that stuff was turned over to the, to the town. And they had a meeting, they sat down uh, with the board and uh, they agreed on everything and everything worked great. It's like the swimming lessons. That's a picture of Bob Shea and uh, Paul Loons. And if you can see the gym, the gym was only 50 by 26. And you can see the auditorium here. I mean, uh, that's where the upstairs there where the balcony was. Okay, Bowen. All right. One thing, one thing the papers were never, we were never short of newspapers, the articles. And in the London Day and the Wesley Sun, they had more articles. Sometimes Chelsea was reading some of the articles, and so which articles did I pick? There's four in here on the Como. But if you remember, Bill, there was Bill, uh, Billy Mitchell and Jim McKenna, both wrote for the London Day. They both had children come through the system from 45 to 70. Then you had Bill Corley, and uh, you had uh, Don Lewis, who was a member here, and then he came on to and won the Wesley Sun. But they were always, and I think Frank just talked to them every day and put something in the paper. But the, the community said a newspaper article reads, Bowling Alley's already give a uh, premium of being one of the most popular features at the center. The men's bowling league will be underway this week and matches Thursday and Friday nights. Uh, due to the large number of children, adults taking bowling matches this center scheduled for use of the alleys have been set up in the building. In November of 46, a low school uh, paper, they had uh, the women's group. The following names of the teams were uh, the co-eds, the Colleen's, the Bombers, the PTA, and the junior boys league was the uh, Chowder House, the Rockets, and so forth. But the men's league, it was, I can remember they were bowling on Friday nights here, and there were dances on Friday nights, so you're lucky you get a parking place anywhere. <laughs> but from 46 to 1954, the Center Bowl and Alley League had numerous teams for the year's league was uh, in operation. They were following, there was Sills Bobbers, the Fishermen, Bunny's Bums, uh, Stonington Market, Joey's Gang, Stonington Community Center, Roland's Market, the American Legion, Knights of Columbus, Sal's Bar, Manny's Tavern, Kell uh, Kellum's Company, American Velvet, Stonington Boatyard, and, and plaques. And uh, then uh, it went along great, and then in, come September of 54, they had another hurricane and uh, wiped out the alleys, and that was the end of the bowling alleys. And, uh, the, the men's league continued, and they bowled over in West, uh, went over in Porkatuck, down in the Cargill Street, down in downtown Porkatuck, at the Majestic Alleys, until about 1958, 59, and then that dropped off. But uh, these pictures are up there. That's the old bowling alleys down in the Kikomo. Okay, badminton. Stoney then had, to, had the opportunity, the girls had some excellent badminton teams. Um, this group here won the state championship. Uh, they all played here at the Como. Two of them, unfortunately, have passed away. Uh, 
Patty Marengolo and Ellie uh, Powers Santos. Uh, Ellie's <coughs> living in, uh, the girl on the left is living up in Mountville, and the one on the right lives in Old, in old Line. And this team got into the Hall of Fame a couple of years ago at Stoughton High School. But they had they had the, the advantage because there was nobody else. Where were they playing? What other team towns had any? <laughs> so, you know, they had a great they had the opportunity. And then uh, the group there in '61, they were all members of the Como, and uh, they won the state championship too. And this team won the sectional championship. Uh, Marsha, Marsha Standish and the Madeira girls and so forth. Uh, they were uh, they had the opportunity. Good. Como comes through. <laughs> Como comes through. weightlifting and bodybuilding started at the community center under Stanley Bennett and Bruce Clarkery. In January of 59, a weightlifting representative of the Stoney Community Center and the London YMCA will meet in February at the community center. A weightlifting platform and Olympic weights for competition have been purchased. In January of 1965, weightlifters from this community center took part in weightlifting up in Peabody, Mass. And then in March of 1960, a teenage weightlifting contest by statewide will be sponsored again this year by the community center. Lifters who will compete in the contest, including Charles McNeil. That picture, one of them was Charlie. That's Ed McCorney up there on the left. And uh, oh, yeah. Alan, uh, I can't try and think what Alan's last name is. I went to high school with him, too. Uh, Charlie McNeil, Eddie McCorney, Bruce and Matt Clackery, Bobby Dimmick, Billy Texera, Bobby Chipperfield, Gene Gazette, John Arruda, Dennis Buck, and Danny Banks. Uh, weightlifting representative Stoney Community Center took the team award for the second annual AAU sponsoring teenage weightlifting competition. And the other teams that were involved were uh, Hartford, New Britain, Bridgeport, Merritt, and Westport. And it lasted until about 64, 65. Uh, that person is Dwayne Allen. And uh, then it kind of new things came in and they moved aside. All right, this is a, this is a picture that John Kenzie had took. And they butchered the names. <laughs> they, uh, on, uh, Use your mic, Dave. Let me get this thing going here. All right, that's Tony Obatella, Tony Serrano, and that's my brother, Doug. That's Sandy Grimes. I think that's Alan Texera. Use your mic, Dave. And Tommy Resendez. <laughs> All right, Frank Turek and Alan Texera. This is Dave Sisk. Dave just passed away a few months ago. Uh, over here is uh, Billy Texera, Stan, uh, Mike Stanley, uh, Paul Rogers, Johnny Aruda, and I don't know who the other one is. And then we're Toldo and uh, Johnny Aruda and Joe Sylvia. But they did this special. Uh, unfortunate, a lot of people never had any pictures, and we had to go with these. And if you saw what was in the picture, you did a heck of a good job, Chelsea, getting that much out of them. <laughs> so uh, those were the pictures. And John Kinsier took him, did an article about the Como and uh, the young and the old and so forth. But uh, and every year, Frank had awards night. And he would give, they'd have contests. And uh, he'd play in pool or ping pong or swimming, foul shooting, golf, archery, plastic modeling, badminton, uh, horseshoes, bowling, shuffleboard, you name it. He always had it. And he also, uh, you know, had rifles and so forth, uh, shooting. And uh, they all, every year he had it. They, either, they had singles or doubles you know, in badminton and so forth, but then he would have a night where they would give out the awards. This is a picture that I had to, I had to put in. It's a, a bunch of the guys that went to work for Frank, and Frank took them down to Coney Island. 
And in the front seat, the, the guy with the ball, a troop cut is Dave Coffey, George Avery, Bobby Browning, uh, Willie Yegga, and I told his wife, he gave me some pictures and I wanted to make sure I took care of him. It was Jimmy Victoria. Jimmy passed away too, unfortunately. But Jimmy had given me some photos. And uh, those guys all grew up here at the Como. They all had seven or eight, ten years on me, but they uh, were all good guys. Everybody got along. Okay. All right, lessons. All right, 1947, they were handy to cap the palm in a person named Patrick Crane was the instructor, woodworking and clay modeling, art classes, uh, and also was an instructor was Mrs. Robert Crane. Uh, plastic modeling, weaving, sewing, basketry, carpentry. Uh, in June of 52, sailing lessons by community center youngsters. We'll begin this week. Instructors are Dave Johnstone, Frank Joe Raymond, and John Vinless. Uh, unfortunately, that only lasted a couple of years. Uh, they had three boats donated to them. Two were sailboats and one was a dinghy that they used to ride out to it. And after the 54 hurricane, two of them were destroyed and one they couldn't find. So that was the end of the lesson. <laughs> Uh, then there was in 54 a uh, carpentry class and then ceramic class instructed by a Mrs. Negro, uh, Minnie Negro of Mason's Island. She was a teacher at the Rhode Island School of Design. In 57 art classes, uh, 57 also modern classes by Nikki Ridden. And then from 56 to 69 every winter there were golf lessons by Wendell Ross. He was a pro at the Stoic Man, a golf course. Sewing classes. Uh, Billy, you took sewing class, didn't you? <laughs> uh, by Henry Chapin. And then one of the biggest things was was the trampoline lessons. Uh, the trampoline lessons. They, Frank in 59, Frank Torek, announces that the new activity for the fall and winter months at the center will be trampoline. A professional instructor, Oliver Allen, will give lessons to children of all ages. Classes will be made up of more than 15 children per hour, and there will be no room, uh, be room for 60 children over a four hour period. Five trampolines will be set up during the class time. All right, so they put a uh, demonstration on, and approximately 125 younger children showed up from the fifth grade into the high school seniors that attend the exhibition Trampling and staged uh, a group uh, from Groton gave the demonstration at the community center. And that lasted until uh, about 62, 63, and it was very, very popular. Very good. Some guys jumped out of the, uh, some guys jumped out of the uh, balcony. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is the nine hole golf course that a lot of people, I know there's new people here, and Wendell Ross ran it, and, and it was a golf course there. It was started in 1925, and it was there until about 1975, and then they built there. But right, right down in here is where Stonington Peter and the gas station is. And uh, it was a nine-hole golf course, and uh, Wendell Ross was a great teacher. Uh, many of, many of uh, young man there, Billy Reed, Johnny Lathrop and Stefanskis and all them came through him and they all, the Timmy Sisk, all those guys landed up being club championship somewhere. But, uh, and then across the way is where Simmons lives and then over to the right where the, the Crowley family lives. But it was a great place, you had, you had plenty, of the, plenty going on. Okay. Okay, some interesting clubs. <laughs> All right, 
July of 1946, a 15-minute club has been instituted at the community center. 15 minutes of free flying for Senate members to Stonington Airport under the direction of Henry Palmer. What it was, if you joined the community center and you wanted to be a member of the 15-minute club, you had to go up in the airplane for 15 minutes. So I asked, I asked Johnny Custodio Sr. Johnny's one of the last of the gang. Johnny, I think, is 90 years old now. I said, John, what's the story with this? He said, I got a great story to tell you. He says, he says I, I uh, went out there to the airports, the Orkney Airport out here, Henry Palmer was running it, and uh, I said to him, yeah, I want to go up. He said, where do you want to go? He said, I want to go over to Durham Mendes over there, and Durham Mendes was over on Mason's Island Road. There was a place where they uh, built, uh, they made uh, shaving uh, blades, razor blades. And uh, so John said, we went over there and we buzzed it when we came back, you know, 15 minutes. He says, so I asked my mother when I got home, Mom, anything happened today? She says, yeah, a plane buzzed us, you know. <laughs> so his mother was working over there, so that's the story. So and then later on, what they would do in this fall, he would, he would get, uh, uh, Mr. Palmer would work with models on them on airplanes and so forth. And uh, the next one was uh, August of 46, members of the Naval Gang of the center will be traveling to Boston on Saturday to see the Boston Braves and the Chicago Cubs. Baseball game, 15 boys have signed up. Now this was started by the major leagues. It was a knot hole gang. Most of the stadiums were built with wood in the 40s and 50s and if you remember, if you always see the pictures, it was like a knot hole and you'd see a little boy looking through the glass, you know, looking through the knot. So they would give benefits to organizations and different people that uh, let them in for free. And one article I read, the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers now, the Los Angeles Dodgers, between 40s and the 50s, they claim they gave out two million free passes to kids under 13 years old so they could go into the ball games. So they had that club. Then in 51, the camera club elected officers and there were President Jim Victoria, Vice President Bobby Thomason, Secretary Richard, uh, Richard Souza, and Treasurer Alden Victoria. Advisors Clarence Wimfeimer, Alfred Fayol, Reverend Mark Paulson, and there was a dock room on the second floor. Uh, then the center, Dramatic Club, members of the Dramatic Club uh, were presented the annual production of Sweet Sally Brown, advisor of Miss Alice Prow uh, Powers, and they presented a number of shows, and they were all held at the town hall. If you remember, the town hall had the uh, Town Hall had your uh, stage up there. Upstairs on the second floor, there were no offices up there. It was just a big hall. And uh, then they had, uh, after the bowling alleys went, they had the Center Rifle Club, boys interested in joining the Rifle Club at the Center. And they went on for about 15 years. Different people ran it. Uh, Carl Rude, Eddie Trent, Joe Burdick, uh, and uh, Mr. Ryan. And then they had a 56 outboard motor club, a new outboard motor club at the center. Charlie Giappone and Custodio Ribello, uh, Paul Previty and Johnny Larkin. And then uh, they had a ski club, which was big popular, very popular. And uh, the ski club uh, started in 63 and uh, Frank was an advisor in the president was a stuck person named Stanley Sifko, and they went all over. I, uh, I was out of them, out of here then by then, you know, because I graduated from high school in 62, but they went every weekend. They went to Vermont, New Hampshire, and uh, they uh, very, very successful. Sometimes there was 30 or 40 of them went to, on that trip. Friday night, Frank had movies for the children, and uh, then he'd send them home, make sure they're home at 9 o'clock. They'd get out of here, He'd get them to go home because the, the older boy come in for the dances. <laughs> but during the summer, he had dances, some, I mean, uh, movies.
couple of times a week, but during Christmas time he had movies and also the uh, merchants down in Stonington donated, like Joe Maringolo donated ice cream for the first 140 youth, uh, youngsters in attendance and uh, Paul Skeps and Bunny Santos and all them. And they showed great movies. He'd get the movies from Payne's cameras over in Westerly, I remember, delivering them back sometimes for him. But uh, they were very successful. Okay, swimming. The big thing with swimming was center first started, there wasn't any place in the borough to go swimming. There wasn't. If you wanted to go off the dock, you know, you had to dive, you had to dive stuff that come out of the sewers. <laughs> you, remember, you remember there wasn't any city surge until 1970 in the boroughs, in, in, the, in the downtown area. But, so they went, they went, uh, and here's what I have, the final trip of the season by members of the Stoughton Community Center was held at Watchock Pond with 37 members of attending. Swimming and picnic took place. Uh, Borough Merchant sponsored the event. Six tri trips were made to Watchock Pond in Charleston. In, 50, in 47, eight picnic uh, swimming parties, or average 40 persons uh, trip, was held at Watchock Pond. And then eight trips at Watchock Pond, 48 again. And uh, the community center had 70 children turn out for swimming lessons at Watchock Pond, and the bus and drivers were recruited to take the old float up to, uh, to the pond. And then they got good word from uh, 1950, the Stoughton Village Improvements Association today announced plans to create a marine playground and swimming place at the, on the harbor side of the Stoughton Point. The borough agreed to cooperate with the movement, develop the after Court Du Bois, president of the society, outlined the proposal special meeting for the warden and Burgesses last night. Uh, the society developed 200 feet of property on the west side of the point, and the borough will take care of the rest. Du Bois announced the society purchased three lots and houses. Uh, those are the houses. That's how the point looked. Those are houses they purchased so that they could get down there. So Village Improvement Society came through and they got that and then it's always been, you know, for 70 years it's been the community center, the borough and the Village Improvement Society and it's all worked. So it's, it's wonderful really when they can, they didn't have a place to swim. You know, where'd you go off? Down the dock down there, the Sea Village, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it, it worked good. And they, a lot of, and then also in the swimming, under the swimming, was, uh, there was a Greek, there, there's your father up there. Isn't it, it, isn't it Greek? No, no. Uh, he, uh, the Gildersleeve family has been good to the community center also, along with the Wimfimers and, and uh, Castles, and you name them, they have loads of them. But they, uh, signed over Sandy Point, so the community center could use Sandy Point. So uh, they used it for a while, but it was tough to, I know, when I was on the police department, it was tough to enforce anything out there. Everybody would say, I'm in Rhode Island, I'm in Connecticut, I'm in Rhode Island. You know, and you sent somebody out there and they didn't know what state they were in either. So, uh, so uh, it was just one of them things. So we, <laughs> they uh, had to, and then we had the Stonington Players, uh, theatrical group. They've always been uh, great with the community center. Uh, they, Mrs. Johnstone, I missed the, Mrs. Uh, Wimfimer started it, and that's a check. They've always uh, came through for the community center, and uh, I think in 19, just 2015, they had this 50th anniversary, and uh, they've always supported the community center. The village fair. OK. 
Okay. First Village Fairs, uh, this year is the 70th anniversary. On August 14, 1952, Stonington Center officials today are tabulating the take of the, uh, yesterday's fair at the Village Green. Activities, first of its kind for the center, surpass expectations. For 2 p.m. until 9 p.m. at the square and fairgrounds, was a, uh, covered with laughter and crowd. According to Miss Alice Powell's Senate treasurer, uh, they made more than $1,300. Uh, the principal money raised at the auction was raised by auctioneer Ernest Domain. Also a favorite was Fred Cuban, nationally known magician, who conducted two shows that were well uh, was sold out. So they've had it, and uh, there's another thing, they've always had it every year, and everybody's been a team member, different organizations have come through for them, and so it's, it's the anniversary's coming up this year. All right, the thrift shop. On November 5th, 1940, uh, the Stoynton thrift shop opened by, the, by Mrs. Albert H. Gildersleeve for the benefit of the British War Relief. At the war's end, the thrift shop was continued by popular demand and the profits were voted to go to the Staunton Community Center. The shop located at the corner of Water Street and Wall Street. That's right now the address is 77 Water Street. In October of 16th, uh, July 16th of 46, under the direction of Al Al Mrs. Gildersleeve, a total of $17,681 was raised for the British War Relief in addition, sending money to buy a mobile canteen and pay for support for two years. In July, Mrs. Gildersleeve recently received a letter from the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., stating she had been awarded the King's Medal for the British government. And in 1952, after six years of key function financial structure of the Stoynton Community Center, the thrift shop will close its door, sadly, and the shop will dispense clothes and clothing but it only stayed closed for about five weeks. In December of 52, the Excuny Center Thrift Shop had reopened in January of 53 at 22 Pearl Street. And they moved around and moved around. They, from, the, the, they, from 1940 to 52, 77 Water Street. From 53, 58, 22 Pearl Street. 58 to 70, 152 Water Street. And 71 to 70, 4161 Water Street and from 1974 to now over here at Cutler Street. All right, the Hendrick, the Hendrick H. Whitman Memorial Award is in memory of Mr. Whitman who died on March 17, 1950. He was born February 27, 1884, in Brookline, Mass., son of William J. Dole Whitman. He attended uh, school in Boston, graduated from Harvard University in 1906. Until his retirement several years ago, Mr. Whitman, uh, Whitman was vice president and treasurer of the Whitman Company, was widely known worldwide. For textile world, Mr. and Mrs. Whitman resided in Hinkley Hill Road, Stonington, for the past eight years, and he was a member of the board, and for many ways. Uh, the community center president, Clarence Wimfeinman, took note of center meeting and passed it, Henrik H. Whitman, to one of the centers directed to praise an interest in the center. And the committee was set up, and for the first award, the Whitman Memorial Cup will be made to junior members of the Community Center for the annual meeting May 27th at the Center. Nominees will be selected uh, for Center activities, good citizenship characterized by her or his or her day-to-day -day con uh, contact, John Finley, and Francis Drake, and William T. Veal, Dr. William T. Veal. Uh, committee set it up. And the first one to win it was Sonny Santos, 17-year-old Stoughton Community Center member, was the first one to win it. Unfortunate, last week Sonny passed away, and uh, the family's here. And uh, so Sonny was the first one, and uh, got the picture. <laughs> and it was Jimmy Victoria got it. That was the one that got it. And the first female to win it 
sitting right behind him was my swimming instructor down the, down to uh, the pond down there was Mary Ann Mallow Smith. And she won it. And 20 years later, her son, and they had two win it that year, in 1972, I believe, mm -hmm. was Jay Mallow and her son. And so she was the first, and then she was the first uh, with a fa father's son or mother-daughter. And uh, congratulations. <laughs> and, uh, then Tommy Resendiz, did he show up here tonight? <laughs> uh, Tommy was the first one to win it twice in a row. Tommy came from a family. Uh, he lived two houses from me, and uh, Tommy came from a house. Uh, Tommy came from a big family, and I always liked the name of him. Eddie, Johnny, Joe, Billy, Manny, Brian, Tommy, Susan, Clara, Rose, Mary Ann. <laughs> they came every year. Every year they come out. So I always like to, you know, mention them. So, uh, anyways, Tommy, congratulations. Okay. Now, the dancers. All right, the first dance that I found in the papers was, uh, in 1946, in, in uh, November, was a jukebox dance and will be held in order every Friday night from 8 to 11 p.m. at the center. It cost us 15 cents to feed the jukebox. <laughs> and uh, November of the same year, Thanksgiving Eve bond dance will be held tomorrow night at the center. Music provided by Frank Joe Raymond's orchestra. Frank also had a son, Frankie Raymond, that came through with the community center. And Frank was a photographer, and we called him up, but he didn't have any, because he took pictures of the Wesley Sun, but he didn't have any. And just about every Friday night from 46 to 69, a dance occurred. Most dances were records in early years. And uh, one thing we were, the community center was very fortunate that the New London American Federation of Magicians, they had uh, a person that was a president, Francis Fain. And he was very good to the center. Francis had a son that was a year older than me and had a daughter that was a year younger than me. And so, you know, they had ownership and they always wanted to, they helped out immensely and he had a lot of local bands play here. But I asked Sammy Agnello just to go through the list. And Sammy was a, you know, a drummer. And I asked Sammy just to go through and see if he knew any of the locals. And he came, this is a list he came up with. I had some of it he didn't have, but the locals was Frank Joe Raymond, the Beachcombers, Charlie St. Ange, Tra the Travel Lines was Bobby Salamino and uh, Sammy Agnello, the foremost was a guy named Carl Kelly, Greg in the group, Greg Piccolo, Charlie Riggs, uh, Larry Padusi, uh Buzzy Goodwin, and Al Copley, the LaSalle's, the chess mates, chess mates with Richard Wilcox, Charlie Buck, from Porkatuck, <laughs> so they, uh, and then the bands that played here, there were the Fox and the Hounds, the Tree Dukes, the Chaplains, the Formos, the Bully, uh, Bo Bowie and the Gulls, the Lasalles, the Rizziums, the Majestics, the Chessmates, uh, George and the group, the Teen Rockers, the Legends, the Customers, there's so many of them. Some of them played, and I also found one one that was interesting, where uh, Frank, they came down with a rule here in 1961, uh, got some strict rules coming in. Regulation regards the type of dress shall be worn at the dances. Outlawed for boys are those clog hoppers and dungarees. And the girls, the Bermudas and the slacks gotta go. And, uh, so it was funny, it was different. And, and it was, it, once in a while somebody would get out of line, but everybody behaved. And uh, you know, the crowds that, that, I can remember when I was on duty, the crowds would walk past up North Water Street, around the corner, and then they walk as far as the town hall, both sides, and they would, the, cars, the cars would be packed. And I also found where they come down with some rulings, sometimes they'd say, well, the, 
they're allowed from St. Bernard's to come here, but they're not allowed from Groton or they come down with some different rules all the time. I guess it all depends what town behaved the worst, you know. <laughs> but uh, well, who, you know, some of the girls went with some of the top guys from out of town, so they had to go and get permission from Frank for them to come in. All right, one of the things that they had here, and I, a couple of years ago, Chelsea and myself, sat down, and Beth Stewart, sat down with Kenny Collins just before the pandemic started. And we went through, and Kenny booked some of the, uh, recording artist, and they were very interested. And uh, Kenny, Kenny, a matter of fact, they stayed at Kenny's house, because I've heard Kenny on the radio say once in a while, uh, there's no midnight train out of Westerly, you know? <laughs> and uh, in March of 63, the Chavans played at the Stony Community Center, and when they played here, their song, that he's so fine was the number one hit in the nation at that time. And they played. But the ones that I found, and the ones listening to Kenny, the ones I found in the papers, and I have the newspaper articles, uh, were Brian Hyland in 1962. His song was great, was Sealed With A Kiss. There was uh, December of 62 with Gene Pitney, Town Without Pity, and Only Love Will Break Your Heart. And the Dovells, Bristol Stomp, Bristol Twist In, Annie and others, uh, the Angels, Cry Baby Cry, My Boyfriend's Back, uh, Johnny Symbol, Teenage Heaven, the Michavans, uh, Les Cooper and his soul rockers, Wiggle Waddle Group, or whatever they call it. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they, Then Ma uh, Marcy Blaine, uh, Bobby's Girl in 63, and in April of 63, Earl's Never, uh, Let's Waddle, Remember When, uh, Trade Martin, uh, That Stranger Used to Be My Girl, and then Bobby Comstock, Let's Stomp. It could be more, but those were the ones I had, and uh, Maddie and Chelsea have done a great job with the music. They, it's, you can go on YouTube and all these recording artists' music is all put on one. And you can listen to them. And uh, maybe some of you go home with your wife's or girlfriends tonight and do a little dancing in the bedroom. But uh, they, uh, they, uh, they really, they really uh, did a great job. And uh, they, uh, 